Hi guys, so as promised yesterday, today I'm going to finish chapter 7 and 8 of the Martin Luther King Jr. book that we were reading in CIA. So yesterday, if you watch yesterday's video, I read to you chapters 5 and 6, which was, um, we started chapter 5 on Tuesday, I think, and so we restarted that in the video yesterday and then finished five, chapters 5 and 6. So today, I'm going to read chapters 7 and 8 to you. So this is towards the end of Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, involvement in the Civil Rights Movement, and it finishes the story. And then after today's video with Martin Luther King Jr., I'll start reading to you some of the biographies of the other important people you'll get to choose from for your writing project when we get back. So today I'm going to start on Chapter 7, Battle for Birmingham. And this sign says, it's nice to have you in Birmingham, Alabama. It says, a sign welcoming people to the city of Birmingham, Alabama, where Martin Luther King led a civil rights campaign in 1963. Dark clouds rumbled over downtown Atlanta as Martin Luther King entered the SCLC headquarters on Auburn Avenue. He was now working as a minister at his father's Baptist church. But he also met regularly with the SCLC to discover the civil rights movement in the South. We need to start a new campaign, Martin said, as the group sat around at the meeting table. Martin's friend, Ralph Abernathy, sat up sipping his coffee. Whereabouts, he asked. Birmingham, replied Martin quickly. Ralph almost choked. You're crazy, he sputtered. Birmingham's the most segregated city in the South. Martin smiled at his friend mischievously. Exactly, he replied. And suddenly, everyone in the room understood. The industrial city of Birmingham was the heart of Alabama, a state famous for its governor's promise of segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. If their campaign could succeed there, it could succeed anywhere. So, in April of 1963, Martin and the SCLC wrote a list of their demands for change in Birmingham. They only had two fair treatment, and fair pay for black people. Birmingham's government responded quickly with their comments. They only had one. Never. So the battle was on. Preparations began immediately. Martin flew to Birmingham and met with his old friend, Fred Shuttleworth. Together, they toured the city's steel factories, pool halls, and churches, encouraging everyone they met to join in protest. Freedom, they shouted. Bring freedom to Birmingham. This photograph, taken in 1965, shows Martin Luther King giving one of the, his powerful speeches to a crowd of young supporters. So you can see Martin Luther King Jr. is there, and all of those people listening to him are inspired by his words and inspired by his actions and his willingness to make sacrifices to um, cause this change in the most segregated city in the entire South. And then you can see this picture. It says, Lines of White Policemen Block Streets of Birmingham in May of 1963. So they were blocking the streets to try and stop the protesters. The campaign began with sit-ins. Suddenly, restaurants and department stores across the city were flooded with protesters, demanding equal rights for the city's black population. The police reacted immediately. Led by their racist chief, Eugene Bull Connor, they dragged the protesters into vans and threw them into jail cells. The SCLC quickly bailed them out, but soon their bail money had run dry. And now, anyone sent to jail risked having to stay there. Alone in his motel, Martin said a prayer. We're struggling not to save ourselves, he prayed, but to save the soul of this nation. Give us strength. That morning, he left his usual brown suit behind and put on his old blue overalls instead. Martin was going to work. As the sun rose on Good Friday in 1963, he led dozens of supporters in a march to Birmingham City Hall. More and more people rushed to the roadside as they passed. Some climbed on rooftops, cheering and waving in support. Martin had never felt so determined or so proud of the people he worked with. Then, as they reached the city center, he stopped. Hundreds of policemen were blocking the road ahead. Bull Connor says, go home, boy, one of them shouted. Blacks ain't welcome here. The marchers waited nervously, unsure what Martin would do next. But then, very quietly, 
Martin knelt down on the hot tarmac and began to pray. After a second, every other protester did the same. The police didn't hesitate. Martin and the other protesters were dragged from the streets, but none of them fought back. Police dogs tore at their arms, but none of them fought back. One by one, they were thrown into cells without any beds or windows, but even then none of them fought back. They refused to let their spirits break. Locked in a dirty cell, Martin managed to get a hold of a pen. He wrote a letter to the people of Birmingham. One has the moral responsibility, he told them, to disobey unjust laws. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. Martin's letter from Birmingham jail, written on scraps of newspaper, was smuggled from his cell. Almost a million copies were circulated around the United States. The caption says, locked in jail in April 1963, Martin Luther King considers the next stage of the campaign in Birmingham, Alabama. And if you go online, you can Google and find Martin's, um, Martin Luther King's um, letter from Birmingham jail, and you can read the actual letter that he wrote because he was able to write it on tiny scraps of paper, like on like post-it notes and things, and he wrote on a ton of these. He was able to send them out of the jail and either keep them in his pockets or his shoes or wherever he hid them. And so when he got out of jail, he was able to put them all together and to write the letter. And it was so inspiring that hundreds and thousands of copies were circulated, were passed out all over the country. So if you go on Google and you Google Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, Birmingham letter, you can read exactly what he wrote. That's part of what we usually do in CIA. We usually read the letter together and do like what we did with Gandhi where we highlight information in it and we talk about uh, cause and effect, like why, what caused him to go to jail and what caused the protesters to go to jail and um, what are some of the things he was talking about in his letter and what inferences can we make about their circumstances. Now we can't do that together because I don't have a copy of the letter here and I'm kicked out of my classroom for the next six weeks. But Google is your best friend. Love Google. You guys love Google. I love Google. We all love Google. It's the best. So go on Google and you can find the copy of the Birmingham Jail letter and you can read it. All right. We're going to keep going. Um, I'm going to show you the picture first. It says terrified young protesters flee from Birmingham police in May of 1963. So you can see how scared they were of the police officers because... Back then, they didn't have laws that would keep police officers from doing bad things, where if the governor told the police officers that you can hurt these people if you want because they're black, then they were able to do that. And everyone kind of knew that. They knew that the system was unfair and that it was prejudiced against people who were black. So the people, in, especially in Alabama, where it was so segregated, that were doing these peaceful protests, even though they weren't hurting anybody, they knew that the police could hurt them and put them in jail if they wanted to. So it was a scary time for a lot of people. It says, by the time Martin was released a few days later, thousands more volunteers were ready to join the fight. But these new protesters were different. Just like the previous marchers, they were brave and determined. But unlike the others, they were children. On May 2nd, 1963, over a thousand schoolboys and girls held hands and sang joyful songs of freedom as they marched into Birmingham. But their voices soon grew faint. Several fire trucks blocked their path. Bull Connor stood beside them with his teeth gritted in anger. Let him have it, he yelled. And suddenly dozens of firemen stepped forward carrying high pressure hoses. Massive jets of water blasted into the young marchers, smashing them apart like bowling pins. Some were tossed into the air and others slammed against walls. Before they could recover, the police were on them, grabbing as many as possible. Those who weren't arrested ran away. But the next day, they came again. This time, Bull Connor got tougher. The marchers were hammered with, bat with batons, savaged by dogs, and even beaten with iron rods. The shocking images were broadcast on television screens across America. Millions watched in horror as black men, women, and children were battered and abused simply for their right to be treated as equal citizens. So we'll read a couple of stories. Um, one of them is about Audrey Faye Hendricks, who is a child in the civil rights movement. And then another one was about Ruby. Oh, I don't remember her last name. Ruby Bridges. There she is. And Ruby Bridges was one of the children in the civil rights movement also. And so they were two of the kids that were 
in these peaceful protests, they weren't hurting anybody, they weren't doing anything wrong, but they were hit and kicked and they were sprayed down with water just for wanting equal rights. And that's how the battle that they were fighting and why Martin Luther King Jr. fought so hard for them. It says, then on the fourth day, something amazing happened. As the protesters marched into the town center, Bull Connor yelled for the firemen to turn on their hoses. But this time, they refused. He shouted the order again, but the firemen stood firm. Martin knew what it meant. Birmingham had had enough. Its streets were awash with the blood of beaten protesters. Shops and businesses were boarded up. Jails were overcrowded, and hospitals were filled with broken and bruised marchers. The city could take no more. So in May of 1963, Birmingham City Hall made an announcement. From now on, black people could eat where they wished, sit where they wished, and talk to where they wished. When Martin heard the news, he cried with joy. But even now, he had one more march to make. On August 28, 1963, Martin led 250,000 euphoric supporters to the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. This time, the crowds weren't just black. By now, the whole country cared about civil rights. It says, encouraged by Martin Luther King, black and white protesters marched together to Washington, D.C. on August 28, 1963. This was a huge day in the civil rights movement because up until this point, most of the protesters, most of the people in these marches were black because they were fighting for their own civil rights. But at this point, when it was happening all over the South, all over the country, even white people started to realize, they're like, this is wrong that they're not treated the same as us. We need to fight for them. And so they were joining in on the marches. They were joining in on the fight because they realized that everybody should be treated equal. It doesn't matter what you look like, but everyone at this point was marching for these rights for black people in America. And then Martin Luther King Jr.'s most famous speech, I Have a Dream, in Washington, D.C. on August 28, 1963. So during this march is where Martin Luther King Jr. gave this speech. And if you look on YouTube, you can look up where, um, just look up Martin Luther King Jr. I Have a Dream, and you can watch the video of him giving this speech. It's incredible. It's a really long speech, but it's worth it. And usually in class, we watch it together um, so that we can pause it, and we can ask questions, and we can discuss and talk about it. We can't do that today because we're not in class, but you can still watch it at home, and you can discuss it with mom and dad or big brother and sister or even little brother and sister about how we should treat everybody kindly and we should treat everybody fairly says they came together beneath the blazing sun to hear Martin Luther King deliver one of the greatest speeches in American history. Standing in the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial, he told them about a dream he had. I have a dream, he said, that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Martin's voice roared from the stage, growing louder and stronger with each word. And when we let that freedom ring, he continued, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing free at last, free at last. Thank God almighty. We are free at last. This picture shows 250,000 protesters gathered in Washington, DC to hear Martin's incredible speech on August 28, 1963. So 250,000 protesters, that's a quarter of a million people. And you can see all of those dots down here are people. They're all gathered here together on this March to hear Martin Luther King Jr. speak at the Capitol, at the Capitol of the nation, where a lot of the lawmakers work so that they can make this change, not just for cities or for states, but for everybody. So now we're on chapter eight. This is the last chapter of the book. Uh, it's called Triumph and Tragedy. So it has a bit of a sad ending, but we don't want to think about the sad ending. We want to think about the message that we learn from this. The author's message is that Everybody should be treated equally. It shouldn't matter if you're black or white or Hispanic or if you're Pacific Islander or Asian. It doesn't matter. Everybody should be treated equally. And you should be treated 
based on your character, based on who you are as a person and not just by what you look like. And that's the message that Martin Luther King was teaching us and that the author is teaching us through his story. It says, Martin Luther King's Washington speech was greeted with mixed reactions. While most of America celebrated, those who still supported segregation grew even more hateful. Back in Birmingham, a group of racists hurled a bomb into a packed church. As the dust settled, the bodies of four black choir girls lay among the ruins. In December of 1964, Martin traveled to Norway to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. It was a huge honor, but after the bombing, it felt meaningless. What future did peace have in the face of such violence? But even so, Martin refused to give up. He now turned his attention to voting rights for black people, organizing a campaign in Selma, Alabama, and then leading a 50-mile march to Montgomery. So 50 miles is about from here to like the Kennewick Mall, walking that distance, um, all of these people together to be able to have the right to vote the same as white people did. The marchers were rained on, taunted, and even pelted with rocks. But once again, they won. In August 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed an act removing restrictions on black voting rights. Now that black Americans had the power to vote, politicians and city officials would have to treat them very differently. Before, black people couldn't vote. It didn't matter if you were over 18, if you were an adult, even people as educated as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. couldn't vote just because they were black. And they decided that wasn't fair. That doesn't show that we're equal people if we don't have the same rights. So now that they're able to vote, the people in charge had to listen to the black community. Before, they listened to them if they were good people, if they thought the same things they did, that everyone should be treated equal and that everybody should have the same opportunities. But now there's a huge population of people that are not able to vote that weren't before. So since they can vote, they're the ones deciding if those governors and the presidents and the senators and all of those important people that we vote for, if they get to keep their job. So if they wanted to stay the governor, if they wanted to stay the mayor or the representative or the senator, they had to make sure that they would get votes not only from the white Americans, but from black Americans also, because now everybody had the opportunity to vote. So as Martin Luther and Coretta Scott King led a protest march from Selma, Alabama on March 21st, Kevin's birthday, 1965. And you can see Martin and Coretta right there in the picture with all of their other people that were marching with them. Even so, Martin couldn't shake his depression. In the 10 years since the Montgomery bus boycott, segregation had been hugely reduced in the South. But a new generation of black Americans were growing up with a new set of problems. Their pay was lower than white people's and their living conditions much worse. Faced with such inequality, many questioned the value of peaceful protests. Instead of freedom, they shouted power. Instead of marching, they rioted. In the summer of 1965, hundreds of black youths clashed with police in Los Angeles, California, trashing shops and burning cars in the city streets. Martin was desperate to remind the country how much nonviolent action could achieve. In the spring of 1968, he and Ralph Abernathy traveled to Memphis, Tennessee, to lead a march in support of black workers. At first, the protest went well, but as it entered the city's shopping district, things turned ugly. One protester pushed a policeman and another threw a brick into a shop window. Martin shouted for calm, but it was too late. The march was in chaos. Police charged at the youths, and as the crowd fought back, Martin and Ralph ran for their lives. Back in his motel, Martin watched the riots on the news. The pictures made him feel sick. Peaceful protests had achieved so much, but it seemed that many black people now thought violence was the answer to their problems. Martin wanted nothing to do with it. He stared at the rain pouring outside his window, wishing he was back home with Coretta and his children. But suddenly the phone rang. It was Ralph. The caption says fires rage in the, seats of Los in the streets of Los Angeles, California, as civil rights protests turned violent in August of 1965. So you can see they started off as this peaceful protest, but then just one push, just one punch or one rock thrown caused all of this chaos. And it shows how one person can make a change. Martin Luther King Jr. decided to make a change peacefully and not hurt anybody, not tear up any shops or break anything. And he made so much change. 
But it also shows how one person in that crowd can push a police person or can throw a rock in a window and all of a sudden everything's in chaos. Everything's on fire, people are hurt, people are getting arrested when it could have been resolved so much more peacefully. And that's all based on the choice of one person. So Martin's phone rings and it's Ralph Abernathy. He says, the protest leaders are gathered in the church downtown, he said desperately. Maybe you can talk to them. Martin was tired, but he had to try. Ten minutes later, he arrived at the church, soaked with rain. On the way over, he planned what he might say. But as he stood above the crowds, the words just came from the heart. He told them about the miracle that had happened in Montgomery. He told them about the pride of the marchers in Birmingham. He told them about Atlanta, Selma, and every other town where courage and determination had won black people their freedom. The power and passion of Martin's words gripped everyone in the church, drowning out the storm that raged outside. When he finished, everyone agreed that they would march by his side, and they would march peacefully. Martin beamed with joy unlike any he'd ever known. For the first time, he felt that this new generation might face their troubles with the same dignity that thousands of black Americans had in the past. Future was in their hands. We've got some difficult days ahead, he told them. But it doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. Martin Luther King appeals to the black, to the youth of Memphis on April 3rd, 1968. This would be his last ever speech. So this speech that he gave to all of these protest leaders where he's begging them to not be violent, to not ruin things and to hurt people, but to do it peacefully, and how it can cause so much change without anybody having to get hurt. That was his last speech, and now we're going to read why. The next day, April 4th, 1968, Martin met Ralph Abernathy at his motel and began planning a new march. He was still tired, but as he stepped onto his balcony and breathed in the spring air, he felt a new strength for the future. Tomorrow is going to be a great day, he shouted to Ralph. Inside his room, Ralph laughed. But then he heard a gunshot. He rushed outside and found his friend lying on the hotel balcony, struck down by an assassin's bullet. An hour later, Martin Luther King died at St. Joseph's Hospital in Memphis. His killer, a racist named James Earl Ray, was caught soon after. Five days later, the bells rang out again at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Thousands of mourners gathered for their final march with Martin, carrying his coffin past Morehouse College and on the Southview Cemetery. Then they all said goodbye to the man who had proved to the world that he was as good as anyone else. The caption says, Huge crowds gather in Atlanta, Georgia, for the funeral of Martin Luther King on April 9, 1968. Martin's coffin was carried on an old-fashioned mule cart, symbolizing the struggle against poverty and hardship faced by millions of black people across America. And you can see all of the crowds of people that gathered to pay their respects to him one last time. So, that's the end of our story, and it's a really sad ending. <laughs> and I wish there was an afterword or something that would make it a little better, so I'm going to try and give you an afterword and a little uplifting thought from it. So... Martin Luther King Jr.'s whole life, remember when he was six years old and he found out he couldn't play with his best friend anymore because he was black and his friend was white. He was so confused. He said, why? Why does it matter if I'm black and he's white? And his mom said, no matter what the world tells you, you are as good as anyone else. And that's the message he wants us to take with us every day. No matter what people tell you, no matter where you live or if you have more money or less money or how educated you are, it doesn't matter. You are as good as anyone else. And you have the opportunity, us as people, as individuals, to make a difference in such a good way, in ways that don't have to hurt people, in ways that we don't have to destroy things, but just by being who we are and by having the passion to make things better and to make a difference. And that's what he wanted us to learn. And that's what the author, Rob Lloyd-Jones, wanted us to learn in his book. So I would love for you guys to read the letter from Birmingham Jail. 
you might even be able to find a YouTube video on it that reads it to you because I know some of the language in it and some of the words are a little difficult. And also, I really want you to go on YouTube after this, and I want you to go search for Martin Luther King Jr. I have a, I had a dream. I have a dream. Blah. I have a dream speech, and I want you to watch it, and I want you to really think about the words he's saying and how we can apply it even today to our lives. All right. Tomorrow, I'm going to start reading you some of these other stories. If you watched yesterday's video and if you watched today's video, will you text me on the Remind app to let me know? I think because these videos are made for kids, they turn off the comments on YouTube. I'm not sure how that works. But um, if you watch this, either text me on the Remind app or send a comment if it lets you. Let me know you've seen it. Make sure to subscribe so that way you get all of the new books that I'm going to read to you over these six weeks. Okay? All right, I'll see you guys soon. Bye.